And so I just would like to start with a word of prayer before we dive into this morning's message. Father God, in this moment, we ask that your spirit would block out any distractions that are in our heart and mind. Father, we pray that your spirit would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that would soften and respond to the work of grace you're doing in our heart. And Father, most of all today, we want to hear your word speak to us, not anybody else's, and it's in your name we pray, amen. And so today, we are beginning a new series called Habakkuk, which is, we titled it as Strong Faith for Confusing Times. And so we live in a world and a society that is filled with trouble. It seems that people are doing whatever is right in their own eyes, and it appears that evil is having its way, and we don't have any control or any, we don't have any way of doing anything about it. But as followers of Jesus Christ, those who have placed our faith in him, we know what the Bible says about God and we know what he says about his promises to us. We know that we are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength. We know that we can be perplexed. We know that we can be beaten, but we know that we won't be destroyed. We know that God gives us everything that we need to live a godly life. We know that he has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. We know that God is for us and not against us. Yet when we look at society, we see people who are being murdered at concerts, murdered at nightclubs, we see children being killed at their schools while they're just trying to get an education. We see criminals running free. We see friends and neighbors who die in the streets. And we see people within God's church take advantage of other people. And we sit back and we say, God, I know about your promises, but where's your justice? God, I know you are just. I know you are fair. I know you are good. But do you even see what's happening down here? Do you even hear our prayers and our cries for help? Church, I know in my own personal life, I've been here many times before. Have you ever been in this spot? What do we do when God doesn't make sense? What do we do when God's promises seem to be missing? And what happens when our hope begins to diminish? Is there a way to come back from that? This morning, we're going to look at Habakkuk chapter 1, and we're going to dive into his story. And his story is going to guide us in what to do when God doesn't make sense in our life. And so turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 1 in the Old Testament. How many of you have read Habakkuk before? Anybody in here read it? Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. And so I, for me, I remember the, one of the first few times I read Habakkuk, and as I went through it, I looked around and I really had no clue what I was reading. I wasn't able to understand it. And so for a while, it took me a while to understand what God was doing. And so here's the truth that I want us to hold on to today that Habakkuk is going to unpack for us. And it's this. I put it in my notes this way. This is what will be in your outline is keep looking up. Keep looking up. And so let me set the context for the book of Habakkuk because it's important for us to understand its context so we can understand how to interpret it, so we can understand how to read it. And so Habakkuk wrote this back in 640 to 610 B.C. And Habakkuk was a prophet of God who was living in the kingdom of Judah. Habakkuk was living in confusing times, though, because Habakkuk knew the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. He knew what it said about the promises of God. He knew that God had made a covenant with Israel. He promised to bless them, to make them a great nation. He would be their God and they would be his people. But at this moment in time, he's not seeing the blessings of God. In fact, they are receiving what it seems to him to be is the cursings of God. How can this be that the people of God are not experiencing the promises of God? And so let's look at the first five verses here. Starting in verse 1. O Lord, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. 
Strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. As a reader of scripture, it's important for us to know the genre of the book we are reading in the Bible. The writers of scripture, yes, they were definitely inspired by God, but they also wrote in the writing styles that were prevalent in their day. Just like we do today, if you've ever been to college and they say, you need to put your paper in the MLA format, there's a certain format. If we want to write a blog, three key steps to a better spirit-filled life. Writers do the same thing. They write in genres and writing styles that are similar to them. And Habakkuk gives us a clue to the structure of his book. He gives us a clue to what kind of style he is writing in. And in verse 2, if you look back at it, he says a few words. He says, how long, O Lord? And Habakkuk wants that to resonate in our brain because he wants us to, to know that this is a reference back to Psalm chapter 13, verse 1. And in Psalm chapter 13, verse 1, it says, how long, O Lord? And I would encourage you, jot that that psalm down. Go back and read it later. It's only six verses. But what happens in that psalm is that psalm is what is known as a lament. It's where somebody sees something that they are deeply concerned about. Things are not right. And so they cry out to God. But with a lament always comes a resolution. And that resolution is always achieved by resting in God's promise. So I say all that to say in the same way, the book of Habakkuk is a lament. The structure of his book looks like this. You can read it later today. Lament, God's answer. Lament, God's answer. And then you see the resolution where Habakkuk sits back and he rests in God's promises. And so this is useful for us to keep in mind because many, many Christians, we sit back and think Habakkuk is just complaining or whining to God. This is not what Habakkuk is doing. He's not complaining in a whiny sense. He sees the people of God that are not living as they should. He sees that there is not blessings, but what looks like rather cursings. And he cries out, God, how long will your people look like this? There is a deep concern for the promises of God to be in the people of God, but he realizes that they're missing because of the people. And so Habakkuk begins in these first few short verses. And what is he lamenting about? First is this, it appears that God is silent. How long will I cry out to you, God, and you don't hear our prayers? God, do you even see what's happening? And Habakkuk lifts up his prayers to God and hears nothing in return. And Habakkuk is sitting there going, God, what are you doing about this? Is wickedness going to win? Has wickedness stopped your promises? And God is silent, and God's not even looking, according to Habakkuk. Then in verses 3 to 4, Habakkuk tells us that his own people, Israel, are doing whatever is right in their own eyes. They have turned from their God who led them out of Egypt and returned to serving gods who were not gods. And the blessings from God have disappeared. The own leaders of the people of God, the chosen people to bring God's salvation to the world, these leaders are corrupt and taking advantage of their own people. And Habakkuk says, How long, O Lord, Will this people act like this? And so for Habakkuk, his pain is real. It grieves him to see the people of God living a life opposed to God. And then he mentions in verse 4 these words, So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. What does he mean by that, the law is paralyzed? The law is not just the law of government. What the law is referring to here is the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And he looks at that and says, all the promises from the beginning of creation through the end of Deuteronomy where God says, look, if you choose to follow me, I am going to bless you. And here's all the blessings I'm going to pour on you. However, if you choose to turn against me, 
here are all the cursings that are coming upon you. And Habakkuk looks at it and says, I know the promises of God, but because your people, God, are acting this way, the Torah, the law, the promises of God are paralyzed. And the law is at an impasse. And why are these promises slacking? Because the people within Israel were wicked and had turned against their God. And Habakkuk looks around the world at him and he begins to think, where is God? Has he forgotten about us down here? Has he abandoned us? Are his promises canceled out now? Have we lost his promises for good? And then Habakkuk does the only thing that he knows to do. And it's to turn to his father who was in heaven and pray once again. Church, have you ever had a time where you went through a confusing time when God didn't make sense? Have you ever been confused about why God allowed something terrifying and horrifying to happen to you? And you cried out, God, where is your justice? God, when I was crying out to you for help, it seems like it fell on deaf ears. Where were you in my greatest tragedy, in my greatest pain, did you not see what happened to me? And have you ever felt like God wasn't listening to your prayers? You're in your room, you lift a prayer up, and you feel like your ceiling fan sends them back down to earth. So you go to another room, and then someone's vacuuming, and it sucks your prayer out of the room. Then you go outside and pray, and an airplane flies over, and you feel like God's not even hearing my prayers. Something is canceling out here. Well, here's what I would tell you. Recognize that you are in good company. That the prophet of God, Habakkuk, the one who heard from God, was exactly the same place that we've been many times. Where he prayed and he felt like God wasn't listening, hearing, seeing, or even working anymore in his life. But he found himself in a place and a space where he went before God anyways and sat at his father's feet and he decided to keep looking up and prayed to his father who was in heaven. And here is the beauty of all of this. Here's where I'm going with all of this. God does hear your prayers. God does see your struggles. He has never left your side one time. He has never turned his back against you, ever. He is there in the midst of your pain, giving you grace so that you can take one step forward. And the next day, when you feel like you can't take another step, he gives you the grace to take a step. He is in your struggle and your pain. He's there to give you joy when all you want to do is mourn. He is there to give you peace, even though you have nothing to be peaceful about. And this morning, I don't know what your injustices are that you face every day. I don't know the pain and the struggle that you walk around with every day, but you know who does? Your Father in heaven. And here's what Habakkuk teaches us. God wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your prayers. He wants to hear your frustrations. He wants you to express your concern and ask him questions, things like, God, how can my spouse just abandon me? And it looks like their life is better than mine. And actually, their life is better than mine. God, how can a person abuse me and get away with it free of charge? God, how can I get overlooked for a job because they hired a friend? God, how can evil leaders be in place in their countries and starve and kill their own citizens? God, how can whatever it is for you? There has to be a space and a place where we lift our prayers up to God because your Father in heaven will hear your prayer. He will answer you. However, here's the big caveat. Habakkuk is going to show us that God's answer is not always what we expect nor what we want. I've seen too many Christians put God on the back burner because God didn't answer their prayer in the way that they wanted. Or they didn't answer it 
when they wanted it. But God never operates that way because God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He's God. We're man. God sees the whole picture of what he's doing in your life. All we see is what is before us each and every single day. And too many people have, because God didn't answer their way and how they expected, they turned away from God and walked away and are more miserable than when they stayed praying and crying out and pouring their heart out to God. Look at verses 5 through 11, and we'll see what Habakkuk says, because he encourages us to keep looking up even when God's answers don't make sense. Verse 5 says, Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own, They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. Now, the crux of the problem for Habakkuk is the answer to his prayer was this. If he wasn't depressed, he's depressed now. God, save and rescue our people. I'm going to come and judge your people and send you into exile. If it were me, this is how I would have wanted God to answer my prayer. Hey, Brad, I see the wickedness. What I'm going to do is save the souls of the people of Israel that are far away from you. I'm going to bring them back to me. I'm going to pour my blessings on them. They're going to be my people. They're going to be my God. Justice will go forth in the land. I will restore order. I will restore all that chaos. I'm going to make it right and put everything right right now so you can enjoy my blessings here and now. That's how I would have wanted God to answer my prayer. And I'm sure that's what Habakkuk was expecting. But it's not. What instead God tells him is Habakkuk, listen, these people that you are deeply concerned and worried about, they're going to go into exile. I'm about to bring judgment upon the house of Israel because of their disobedience. And Habakkuk is lamenting about God's covenant promises and saying, God, everything is falling to pieces, and your answer to me is that we're going to go into exile. God tells him he's going to raise up the Chaldeans, and the Chaldeans were those, we all know them as the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire is about to come in, take them all out to exile, and God's judgment is coming to the house of Israel. So Habakkuk was confused. God's not making sense to him. Because here's the question he had to wrestle with. How could God use a wicked nation for his purposes? Church, that's the question we all wrestle with. How could God use someone who is wicked to accomplish his purpose in our life? I know we've all asked that. How could God allow mass shootings? How is that accomplishing his purposes? How are babies that are being killed, how is that accomplishing God's purposes? How could God allow this judgment to happen and it fulfill his work and his purposes? You see, Habakkuk needed to be reminded, as we do now, that this is how God has operated from the beginning. If you look back at Genesis chapter 15, in Genesis chapter 12 actually, God makes a covenant with Abraham and says, I'm calling you out and I'm going to bless you. And then in Genesis chapter 15, God makes the covenant, and he seals the covenant, and he tells Abraham, he brings him outside and says, look at all the stars in the sky. Count them if you are able to. And he said, if you're able to count all them, that's how many your offspring are going to be. And then just a few short verses later, look at what he says in verses 13 and 14. God says, but know for certain 
that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possession. What God was telling Abraham is this is where Israel goes into Egypt and is in captivity and is in exile for over 400 years. And God used the wicked nation of Egypt to accomplish his purposes and the lives of his people in Israel. And if you're Habakkuk, hearing that your people are about to go into exile and a wicked nation is going to rule over you, you would begin to think that he would lose hope. That if we were to pray that and God responds, I'm going to have something worse happen to you, we would sit back and go, God, okay, that's not making me hopeful. But God told him something very specific and very important in these short verses that gives him hope that allows him to keep his faith in God and to keep his faith in the covenant promises that God gave to him. Look back at verse five. Here's what God tells him. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a, what's this word? Work in your days that you would not believe if told. When I first read this verse, I had a couple questions. Is God saying this? in a positive way, like, hey guys, I'm about to do something that, look, wonder, be astonished, because I'm going to do something so great, it's going to be so amazing, and you're going to love it. Is that what the writer's wanting us to catch? Or is the writer wanting us to catch this? Look, look around, wonder and be astonished. I'm about to do something so amazing that here's the reality, you're not going to believe it, even if you were told. Which way is it supposed to be as I studied it here's the answer it's both it's good news for those whose faith and hope is in God but it's bad news and judgment for those who look at God and say I know what you say I know the blessings that you would give if I followed you but I am going to turn my own way and live life for myself for that person judgment so this is awesome news it's hopeful news that man God is doing a work and here's what I want to encourage you today in the silence in the times you feel like God is not listening in the times where God has not answered you God is at work even if we don't feel it even if we don't see it and we don't hear it God is working and accomplishing his purposes through you. And so even though it's good and some will receive judgment, those who put their faith in God, they are receiving salvation because of their hope and faith in God. And if we look back into the beginning of Scripture, you see Adam and Eve disobey God. They were exiled out of the garden. But did God cut them off? No. God still maintained a relationship through them as they offered their faith and hope in them. You see the story of Israel where they went into Egypt, went into exile, but God didn't leave them there. He brought them out of exile, out of Egypt, and just like he said he was going to do back in Genesis 15, they came out with great possessions. The king of Egypt said, God is judging us. We want you out of here, and we're going to give you gold. We're going to give you wealth. Just get out of our country and sends them off with exactly what God said that he was going to do for them. They would be exiled for 400 years and come out with great wealth. You see, God holds to his promises. He is always working. He is never slack. He is always working in his time, not our time. And Jesus picks up the same thing. John chapter 5, Jesus says this in verse 17. My father is working until now, and I am working. Then we jump down to verse 22, and here's what Jesus says. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father who sent them. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has what? Eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. 
in the work of Jesus, we see that there is judgment for those who reject him, but there is salvation and a return from exile for those whose hope and belief is in him. And this is what Habakkuk needed to be reminded of. He needed to be reminded that if there was an exile, there was also a return from exile. There would be God's salvation. He would see God's salvation that would come forth where people would be brought from death to life. And even if that exile didn't come immediately, Habakkuk's faith would be in God's promises and in God's salvation. And here's the reality. Habakkuk never lived to, day, the day, lived to see the day where his people were brought out of exile. And so here's, what I, here's why I say that. Because we might be praying for something, for, to see a work of God in our life or in someone else's life, and me, we may never see it on this side of eternity. But we still have to believe that God's promises are yes and amen. Every one of them. And if we believe that, yep, give God a praise. And Habakkuk teaches us that even when God doesn't make sense, we must wait patiently for his salvation, even if we never see it. Because what God has promised, he has done. And this is what God wants Habakkuk to understand. Yes, judgment is coming on his nation, but his salvation was coming. And Habakkuk is to keep looking up, keep praying, keep seeking, keep chasing after his Father who is in heaven. And in the same way, church, how do we handle things in life when God doesn't make sense to us? I want to read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. This is what Paul says. So we do not lose heart. Though the outer self is wasting away, our inner self is, be, is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Here's what Paul is getting across to us. When we go through pain, when we go through times in our life where it doesn't seem like God's justice is there, we have to compare the short-term pain that we're enduring with the eternal glory that we are going to have on the other side of eternity or when Jesus comes back. And he wants us to put this in our mind. The pain, yes, it's real. The pain, yes, it's deep. Never minimize. It hurts you. It causes that struggle. It's frustrating. It makes you cry. It makes you worry. It makes you doubt. All of that's real. But he says, think about this. That is short compared to the eternity of God's blessings where God says, I have made a home for you. I will be your God. I will put you right. I'm going to put the world right. Creation can stop groaning. You can stop groaning. We're going to receive bodies that no longer die, bodies that no longer got sick, sickness, pain, all of that will be done away with forever. So he says, look at the forever and compare it to your temporary. This is what he means by those light momentary afflictions. They're transient temporary. They come and then they go. They come and then they go. But eventually those end. But God's promises are always eternal. But here's what happens. I want to give an illustration because this is me speaking from my own life. And so I coached basketball for a few years and one of the last times that I coached, we had a very young team that only one of them had ever played before and it was like on a middle school team. And so we had to teach them the fundamentals of the game of basketball. Like we said, okay, guys, we want you to dribble from this side of the court to the other. And then as they're going down, like the ball is going all over the place like a ping pong ball. And we're like, okay, we're going to have to start even more basic. Let's stand still and let's dribble. And we told them that 
to play basketball, you have to be able to dribble the ball so you can move the ball down the court. You have to be able to dribble in a way that it doesn't get stolen. So this is what we would see kids do. Some of them, it was a very horrifying experience because every time they put the ball down, it hits their legs and it goes off somewhere and they have to chase it. But others of them, when it came time to practice, this is how they were practicing, and we would always tell them, keep your eyes up. Don't look at the ball. Keep your eyes up so you can see. But this is what they did. Then you know what they do in the game? <laughs> and we'll pass the ball to Johnny. Pass the ball to Johnny. Johnny's open pass. Somebody comes along and steals the ball. Here's what, here's what I want to get at. The kids were doing what we told them to do. Control the ball. Look at the ball. Don't let go of it. Don't lose it but they couldn't see the ultimate goal of where we were headed because all they could see was this ball banging at their feet. Here's what happens so many times in our life. That pain and trouble comes in that we don't like, that we don't agree with. And all we look at is this struggle. And all we see is this struggle. This is what we make life about. And if God doesn't operate with this how we want it to, then for some people, we stop playing and we put the ball down and we walk away. But see, God wants us to change. Yes, this pain is here. Yes, this pain is real. But we need to get our eyes off of the pain and put it on where it belongs, which is on Christ. Amen? Amen? And I know it's easier said than done. I'm with you. I'm broken too. I wrestle with this. But what I found is, so many times, when I focus on this, my life gets crazy and gets out of whack. I've mentioned it before that my wife and I have had issues conceiving. And there was a period of time where I was going around to all the doctors, doing everything they wanted me to do, taking this pill, putting on this gel, doing all these things, like popping these vitamins and doing it twice a day, mixing this little powder drink, doing all this stuff. And it got to a place where I told Kelly, I was like, I'm going to lose my mind. Because I made my life about the problem of not having kids. And everything I did was about this. And when we were in one of our life groups, I talked about that, and I said, Kelly and I have just resigned ourselves to the fact of, if the Lord wills, he wills. And what a breath of fresh air that was. Because in our struggle, we realized, you know what? We're going to put it in God's hand. We're going to keep looking up. We're going to keep praying even if we never see it on this side of heaven. Our faith is in God. He's good. Our faith is in him. He's just. And the reality is that justice will go forth, but it's going to always happen in God's time. And so rest assured, you're never alone in wrestling with this. But our attitude must be like Habakkuk saying, you know what, God, I've read your word, and I've seen how you've kept every promise. Every time people have gone to exile, you've brought out a remnant of people who had faith in you, who loved you. You were their God. They were your people, and you did a work of grace in them. And so we're going to keep our faith and hope. We're going to keep praying. We're going to keep looking up because you've called us to run this race and to win the prize, and our prize is what you're going to give us. And glory is going to see you face to face in all your beauty and all your glory. And so these troubled things, yes, they're hurtful, but they pale in comparison to the greatness that we're going to see one day. And so this morning I want to give you the challenge is this. If you're hurting, if there's something you're wrestling with, keep praying. Don't stop. His answer will come. And we know, like Paul said, all things work together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That's all things. And all is all. All your hurt. And so the worship team is going to come out and lead us in a worship song and again, I'm going to just allude, the altars are here, they're open. And the altars are nothing to be ashamed of, it's nothing to be afraid of. If you're sitting back and you've been holding on to your trouble, you've been holding on to your pain, go to God. He's hearing. He's working in your life. His word says that he's working. And this is a moment where you can keep looking up by lifting your prayers up to him. Father God, we just pray in this moment, Father, that you would impress it upon our hearts to keep trusting your word, to trust your promises, that you have never broken any promise that you have ever made. 
You are the faithful one, Father. We are the ones that are unfaithful. But Father, the beauty of your word is even in those moments where your judgment is here, your salvation is there for everybody who places their hope and faith in you. So I pray for those of of us in here this morning that have never done that, that today would be the day that our prayer would cry out to you and say, God, my hope is in you. My faith is in Jesus Christ. Save me. Give me your blessings. Give me your promises so that I may know you and be known by you and know that you love me above anything. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen.